So Kitty's talking with Mr. Butler. Who's Mr. Butler again? Is he a magician? No, he's a commoner. Remember early on, she, um, she's delivering a book for the hairnecks. She takes it to Mr. Button. She goes in his house. She's find, she finds out, you know, he's a guy who's got one leg missing, partially, it looks like below the knee. Um, and his house is full of books and stuff. And, you know, he mentions, you know, a pile of books fell and, and such. And so she goes and she helps him. And he talks about, you know, it's not only magicians who can read and things like that. And she offers to become his assistant. She's going to help him, you know, organize books and all that kind of stuff. And he asks her, you know, can you read Czech? Can you read ancient Hebrew? Top take blah, blah, blah. She said, of course not, because she had a public education, right? Which was all about what? Louder. Propaganda. Propaganda. S selling the glories of Britain, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't about real education. So he takes her on and agrees to kind of train and teach her. So he helps her in her study, but he also finds out what kind of student is she. She's the commoner equivalent of the theme, right? I mean, she just picks this up naturally. So she starts learning these languages. And we're, where we open, I'm going to back up for just a moment. Um, no, it's not where we open. Can't remember the chapter is, but we see her summon a demon, and the demon tries to trick her, etc. She doesn't fall for it, and that's that's how we're introduced to that part with Mr. Bat. So we know pretty early at the outset of the novel, Kitty one is still in London. She's never left, even though the story was she was going to leave. <coughs> Two. She's now learned magic. She's learned spells. And three, she's now able <clears throat> she's now able to summon demons herself. Okay? She's a commoner still. Telling us, showing us there's no difference between magicians and commoners. Which we already knew from the previous two books. The only difference was the magicians had been trained in, what do you want to call it? The tools, the techniques, the right buttons to push, so to speak, um, for calling up the demons and such. Okay. So, she's speaking with Mr. Button, chapter 18, bottom of page 239. Now, before we get to that, what's the general... Atmosphere, let's say, in London at this time. What what's going on? How's how are the wars going? Is England winning all their wars? Are there one victory after another? The March of Prague? No. Okay, it's kind of bogged down in the colonies. Okay, what is Nathaniel slash John's new job? When we finished the previous book, he'd been promoted to Minister of Internal Affairs rather than Assistant, okay? And we're told relatively early on in this, you know, a couple of years go by, and then he moved, he takes kind of a lateral move and becomes Minister of what department? Defense. No, not Defense. It's related, but it's not the Minister of Defense. Information. Information minister. Which is really what? Have any of you read um, not Bradbury? Orwell's 1984? Well, in Orwell's 1984, you have the Ministry of Truth. Right? He's the information minister. This is what he is. What, if you haven't read Orwell's 1984, you really are. Ministry of Truth is the exact opposite of what it sounds like. Nothing that the Ministry of Truth says is true. 
right? In in Orwell's um, world in that novel. What about what John uh, Nathaniel puts out? You know, we see that scene early on where he's in his he's in his uh, parlor, he's eating breakfast, and Piper, his assistant, comes in and she shows him shows him some posters and such, and he thinks, you know, how the poster can be strengthened. You know, it's got a picture of a, of a soldier, and it's you know, fight for Britain and the British way. And he says it complete. It means completely nothing, of course. And she says, "Oh, I think it's very profound. Why? Because she's hot for him. That's why." It has nothing, and he's like, I think the poster can be improved, you know, put some of his family behind him. And she's like, oh, yeah, send his wife. And he says, no, 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 we don't want the wife involved. The wives are the ones who get angry when their husbands don't come home. But parents, you know, little sister, show what he's fighting for, all that kind of stuff. It's all propaganda. That's what he is now in charge of, spreading official lies. And he knows the truth, right? That's why it's important. That's why it's important that Stroud puts him in that position. He knows the truth, and he knows everything he's saying is a lie. Right? Is, <laughs> is Stroud trying to make some kind of political point with that kind of portrayal? You're not in your head, yes. Why? If you have a minister of information, what is the purpose of that ministry? To control what the author is saying. To control information. Right? Do we, United States, have a department of information in the federal government, in the executive branch? Is there a cabinet level secretary of secretary of information? No, there's not. What's the closest we get to that? The press secretary. The president's press secretary. Who, every day, most presidencies, comes out and gives what? The daily briefing. What the president's been doing today, what the president thinks about X, Y, Z. What does every presidential press secretary what must they be willing to do? Let me put it that way. Utter bold, bald-faced lies about the issues of the day. That is, somebody asks the president a question, the press secretary knows what the president really thinks about that, but the person cannot give that answer because it's going to anger an awful lot of people. Possibly. And it could be about the most stupid, mundane issue, you know. Somebody's upset with a Netflix special or whatever. Or it could be about, you know, a pretty important thing. China's just, you know, launched a hypersonic missile that could all kinds of stuff. Well, what does the president do? Well, you know, we're valuing our money. Okay. It seems to me that one of the things Stroud is doing here is he setting all of this in, you know, the fantasy world because he can talk about things that it's a lot harder to talk about in the real world. Because if this, if this were set right here, right now, it wouldn't be read as pure, unadulterated fiction. It would be read as a commentary, a social commentary on the current situation at the time when the novel was written. Okay? So... The situation at hand is we've been told earlier the commoners are not happy. They're not buying the stories that they're being told. What else are we told? We, we've, there was a scene earlier where <coughs> um, Nathaniel has one of his demon spies come in and tells him, and then Piper confirms this, that there are more and more instances of commoners seeing demons. And in the particular one I'm, I'm thinking of, and I can't remember the demon's name, I just read it because it was like the third or fourth chapter because I've forgotten it. Um, he says, you know, this commoner 
saw my golden crest. Okay? And Nathaniel's like, but you don't have a golden crest. He said, yes, I do. On the sixth and seventh planes, you can't see it even with your lenses. This commoner could. Okay? And we're told this is like the 43rd, Piper mentions, 43rd, 45th, something like that, instance of illegal commoner sightings of demons. So they've now made it illegal for commoners to be able to see what they can see by birth, by nature. All right? Things aren't going well. More and more commoners are being born with resiliency. So, bottom of 239. I can hardly blame the commoners for their unhappiness, Mr. Button said. The war has gone on far too long. I fear Mr. Devereaux is not acting as he should, but what can we do? What does it mean Mr. Devereaux is not acting as he should? What has John said earlier about how Devereaux is, at, is, happen, is acting? Well, the novel opens, you know, there's Mandrake having his breakfast and stuff, and Piper brings in, you know, another invitation and a package from Devereaux. What's in the package? What does he think is in the package? A toga or a toga party. It's not. No, it's a mask for his masquerade ball. And he's like, he shouldn't be doing this. He also gets tickets for the latest make peace, you know, mishap, horrible play. He said, I don't have time for the theater. Why? The world's going to hell in a handbasket. And he said, you know, and I've got to manage all this information. That's kind of what Button is getting at, that Devereaux is not acting as he should. He's not taking, he's not taking the situation at the time seriously. What can we do? Even I, a magician myself, and am helpless. He's a commoner, but he's a magician. Power is concentrated with the council, Lizzie. The rest of us must watch and hope for better times. Well, well, I can understand your distemper. If a friend of yours was killed, I'm sorry for your loss. Have another cake. Okay. So they talk back and forth, and she asks him, what is the other place? I mean, what's it like? In the previous two books, what have we heard Bartimaeus say about the other place? It's where he comes from, first of all. Does he have a physical, material existence there? No, he doesn't. So what happens when he's called from the other place to this place? His essence gets constrained. Right? Like there are bounds, put a band put around it. That's why it's painful. How long has he been on earth? At the time when he shows up in Devereaux's party as that, you know, weak frog that's kind of falling apart now. How long has John Mandrake kept him enslaved on earth at that point? For two years. Okay. Previous book ended when John was 14. We find out at the beginning of this one, he's now 17. Three years have gone past. The first year, John let him go back and forth. I mean, he let him go back to the other place, and then he called back, sometimes for major things, sometimes for minor things. But now, once he became information minister, he's had him here constantly. And he does tell us, part of me does tell us, it is possible for a demon to remain on earth indefinitely and still live. But he's been in situations that have taxed, you know, his being, let's say. So, she asks, what's it, what is it, what's it like? A region of chaos, a world of endless abominations. This is the top of 240. Dulac, if I remember rightly, called it a sump of madness. We cannot begin to imagine the horror of such a realm. It's enough to make a man want a third. So magicians have visited it? Notice her question is a very logical question. 
How can somebody say what something is if they've never experienced it? How do we know it's a region of madness? Unless you've been there and gone mad, you know? I mean, they'd have to have to have done, right? To know what it was like? Um, no, not exactly. In general, the authorities use reports from reliable slaves. Who were the reliable slaves? The deeds. How reliable are the deeds? You're shaking your head, they're not. Okay. Are they all unreliable? How is Bartimaeus as a narrator? Is he a reliable or unreliable narrator? Can we trust what Bartimaeus says to be true? Or does he just lie through his teeth all the time? What does John think? Notice I call him John, not Nathaniel. What does John think? He thinks Bartimaeus is an untrustworthy demon, right? And yet, I don't want to give away anything at the end. Did any of you finish this? No, okay. Um, and yet, up to this point, on the really big things, does Bartimaeus lie? No. He's honest. Okay. So, he says, to venture there in person is another matter. It risks both body and soul. So it hasn't been done. Oh, it's been tried. Pacino, for example, he hoped to gain demonic power and said he lost his mind. Literally. It did not come back. He went, tried to go to the other place, and his mind is, what Button is saying, is still there. His body's here. No, the details are too revolting. Go on. She, she's like, tell me more. Certainly not. It, there has been a smattering of others, but all were left insane or worse. The only magician who claimed to have succeeded in the journey was Ptolemaeus. He left details in his apocrypha, I want to say is the book that Kitty delivered to him. I may be wrong there. It may just be he mentioned the book in that section. But they are of dubious value. In effect, he implies that the procedure can only be achieved with the help of a benign demon whose name is invoked to create the gate. Palpably, the notion is ridiculous. Who would seriously trust the demon with their and it is likely that Ptolemais himself suffered as a result of the experiment. By most accounts, he didn't live long afterwards. And then we're told what Kitty's thinking. Because bear in mind, this is Kitty is narrator. Trust. Bartimaeus had emphasized exactly that. Ptolemy had been willing to put his trust in him. As a result, there was no limit to their bond. That is, their bond. The thing that tied them together was not limited. It was extentless. They trusted each other implicitly and unconditionally. Or they got to that point. Okay. Kitty gazed up the ceiling, remembering the Jenny's challenge to step out of the circle. She hadn't done it for the obvious reason. He'd have probably torn her limb from limb. Mm, no trust there on either side. So she asked, I take the afternoon off. He says yes. She takes the booklet. There it was, three from the top, slim volume, tall amazing, apocrypha. Old investigative habits die hard. She's going to take the afternoon off and she's going to read tall amazing, apocrypha. Okay. She goes home, and as she does, we're told, bottom of 241, the faces of the people she passed were pinched and sullen. Their shoulders hunched, they gazed at their boots as they trudged along the road. Pinched, their faces are kind of squeezed, sullen, a little anger or discomfiture, okay? And notice, they look at the ground. Nobody's walking, head up, chest out, Smiling. Right? Vigilance spheres whirl above the streets. Everybody's being watched. 
Her pace grew slower, page 242. Her, her gaze dulled and unseen. She felt weighed down by the utter futility of things. What? What's meant by the, <coughs> by the utter futility of things? She expresses the same idea in book one and book two, more so in book two because she's there more. Well, take that back. In book one, what does she think about what is the good the resistance is doing? It's totally ineffectual. Right? Even in book two, with the raid on the Westminster Abbey as a whole, what's the point? Right? The utter futility of things. Three years she'd been shut up in libraries, dust around, playing at being a magician. All for what? Nothing had changed. Nothing would change. A cloak of injustice lay upon London, and she, like everyone else, was smothered by it. The council, who's the council? Look at the cast of characters at the beginning. Council is essentially... Rupert Devereaux, Carl Mortensen, Helen Malbendi, Jessica Whitwell, Bruce Collins, Sean Mandate, Jane Farrar. And maybe you could throw in Quentin Matrix, because he's, you know, like inseparable from Devereaux and such. Okay? They're the, like the, they're like, you know, the president's national security council. The president, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, etc. The council did what they pleased, oblivious to the suffering they caused. And she was unable to do anything about it. It's all true. Right? But she says, or she thinks, nothing had changed, nothing would change. But between the second book and this book, what has changed? And I don't mean what has changed because of Kitty, or what has changed because of John Mandel. What is happening more and more? See, in the first book, how many commoners did we know of who had resilience? Kitty, Stanley, and Fred. Right? In the second book, that gets bumped up to a total of 11 members in the resistance. And they each have a different kind of resilience, right? Now, seemingly, there are hundreds. Okay? And many of them are under the age of 18. People are being born more and more and more with this. So when she thinks nothing would change, whatever should be added. What, what's Kitty really, you know, the progressives in Congress, the, the proverbial squad, what do they want to happen now? The, the AOC and, and her crowd. What do they want to happen now? Radical, massive change, right? Not ploddingly, you know, chipping away and making things change over time. They want it to happen tomorrow. That's what Kitty's thinking. It needs to happen now. But it is happening. It's just happening over time. She wants to accelerate that time. Okay. So she goes to, to the frog, the place where she works, and Mandrake shows up. Let's see here. Page 246. She goes out with him. And She says, middle of the page, so what are you going to do? Kill me? He blinks. He's like, what? No. I, why not? Isn't that what you do to traitors? Or to anyone who crosses you? One of your demons was here two nights ago. It killed him. He had a family. He'd never done anything against the government. But it killed him, even so. Not my fault. No, except you control the government. They're just the slaves. You direct them. Right? 
I mean, it wasn't me personally. I mean, yes, that is what magicians do. But I didn't send this guy. That's not my department. Notice what he's trying to do. He's trying to oh, what's the phrase? compartmentalize. I work for a different branch of the government. I don't work for the branch of the government that violates all your non-existent rights. You know, I work for the other branch. She says, sorry, it's just the most lamentable excuse I've ever heard. Not my department? Ooh, that makes it all right then. I suppose the war isn't your department either? Or the night police? Or the prisons in the tower? None of those have anything to do with you. No, no, because you're the Minister of Information. That's right. He says, no. Now, can you shut up? Okay, and, you know, they go back and forth. And they talk about the resistance. And she says, we were fighting for ideals. Ideals. What's at the root of that? Ideas. That is, certain things, certain truths. He says, well, so am I. I admit to being discourteous in the present instance. He waves a hand, shadow falls. He says, so the demon's gone. He says, now you can talk without fear. I was on guard. What normally happens next when you arrest someone? The bottom torture, the beating. What's it going to be? Why is John there? I mean, he hasn't said why she, why he's there. I've not arrested you. You're, you're not being arrested. I just want to talk. Then I'm free to go. I am here as a private individual, not as a member of the government. Really? Can a quote-unquote cabinet-level secretary ever speak to somebody else as a non-cabinet? No. You can't really divorce that aspect, especially in this world. So if you don't stop your histrionics, that may change. Officially, you are dead. That is, nobody else knows. Yesterday I received word that you were alive. I wanted confirmation. Okay. Who told you I was here? The demon was it not important. Nick Drew. Who's Nick Drew? He's the only other member of the resistance that escaped the raid on Westminster Avenue, okay? She accuses him of murder, essentially. He says, I'm a minister, not a murderer. I help protect our people against, against, against terrorists like you and your friend. Yeah, because the people are so safe in your care, she says. Half our young men are dying in America, and we've got the police mauling others in the street, Demons attacking anyone who protests, and enemies and spies at large in our suburbs. We're all having a great time. Okay? And again, it's really hard to, to not go where I really like to go. What's she saying? What is the purpose of government? Let me put it that way. Think, think you know, American founding. What was one of the things Jefferson said in the Declaration of Independence about a government's right to govern depends on what? It must have what for it to be a lawful government? It must have the consent of the government. What does government say? It must have the consent of those who are being Government. If it doesn't have that consent in Jefferson's day, it is an unlawful government. And what must the governed do? The people who love Thomas Jefferson, they often don't talk about this. That's why he said every generation there ought to be a revolution. Because every generation needs to rise up to make sure. The government still has its, the people's, consent. What's her point? You don't have our consent. Look at again what she said. Half, who's the our young men? Who are fighting in America in this book? Commoners, not magicians. Okay? 
Where did most of the troops, for example, who died in Iraq, Afghanistan, you can go back to Desert Shield in 1991, you can go back to Vietnam, where did most of those troops, the real vast majority, what level of society, our society, did they come from? Did they come from the upper crust, the one, two, five, ten percent? Did they come from the political class's children? No. They came from the middle and lower class. Okay. That's why when you do have well, a member of Congress who is an active member of the military or is a military in reserve, you know, a member of the military but on reserve, Tulsi Gabbard, for example, um, that's why, you know, that kind of individual stands out because they're not like the rest of their compatriots, so to speak. Right? If it wasn't for us, it would be much, much worse. We use our power to rule for the good of all. That's the problem. The commoners need guidance. Eh, we're going through a ropey patch. You know, inflation rising, supply lines. <laughs> That's where I said I should go to places where I don't, shouldn't. That's the ropey patch, he said. We're, we're having a, a tough time right now. Your power is based on slavery. How can it be for anyone's good? Notice anyone is a Thomas. Why? I mean, that's Stroud's choice. That's not the publisher just deciding to throw in some italics to change up the reading. What's he emphasizing there? Who's not included in any way? Who are the enslaved? Who in another sense? Who are the secondary enslaved? The commoners, right? Because they're the ones going off and fighting the war. Do they really have a choice in the matter? Mm, not so much. The magician seemed genuinely shocked. Not human slavery. In other words, we wouldn't do that. I mean, we're not other a-holes. We're not that bad. I mean, they're just demons. Makes it better? Does it? I think not. Notice what Kenny's just done. Especially in John Mandrake's eyes. She's equated demons and their welfare, what is good slash best for them, with humans and what is good slash best for them. In other words, She's erasing the distinction between them morally. She's saying demons have moral rights. That's not so. And notice, his answer is faint. Like, he can't even muster up the strength to vigorously defend himself. That's not so. It is so. And I think you know it. What's that say? I think you know it. What's she telling you? Or let me put it this way. What's that telling us Kitty thinks about John Mandrake? Yes. In his heart of hearts, he knows what he is doing is wrong. And if he knows it's wrong, that means there's still what inside of him? There's still a moral compass. It hasn't been destroyed. What did Bartimaeus say to him at the end of the first book, before he, before Mandrake released, before Nathaniel released Bartimaeus? You've still got a bit of conscience. You've still got a bit of honor. Don't let him take that away from you. What do you want? Why are you here? The resistance was a lone climate. I was told. He pulls the coat up around him. Okay. 
Why? Physically, it's implying he called. What else does it imply, though? Think, you know, nonverbal communication. He's pulling that coat up around him. He's like this. He's wrapping himself up in his defensive shield. Okay? I was told you saved me from the gold. That you risked your life to save mine. mine. I was also told you died doing it. Now that I find you alive, I am naturally curious as to the truth. Okay, I'm curious to what truth? Because the obvious truth is standing right in front of him, right? She didn't die, he saved her. So the truth is, he was lied to that she died trying to save her. So what's the truth he's after? Did you really save me? Because that then begs the question, which also begs the question, both of those together, why would he lie to me to protect me? Why would a demon lie to its master to protect somebody else? What does that say about the relationship between the demon and that other individual? Has Mandrake so far asked Seriously, of Bartimaeus, why do you dress like that when he takes the form of Ptolemy? Not yet, he hasn't. I mean, he, in what other form does Bartimaeus take in this book? Kitty. Okay. Why does he take, and when does he take Kitty's form? He takes it in two different situations. When he's by himself sometimes off on a job, like he was when we first see him in here, he's in Kitty's form. Okay? But he also takes it in Mandrake's presence. Why? What does it do to Mandrake? Yeah, man, it makes him all angry. Right? And Bartimaeus does it just to piss him off. Okay? Why does Bartimaeus take Kitty's form? Why does he take Ptolemy's form? He's bonded with them. Has he bonded with Nathaniel? You, you shook your head no, and you kind of, yeah. I think it's between those. Yes, he has to some extent. I mean, that's why at the end of the first book he says, don't let him take the good away from you. At the end of the second book, it's kind of like, you're, you're on the wrong track. Okay? He takes the form of those he admires. And if he admires them, he looks up to them. And if he looks up to them and admires them, what is that showing there is between he and that other individual, Ptolemy or Kitty? There's at least some level of trust. On Kitty's part, as of this point, how far does that trust extend? Let me out of the circle. No, <laughs> no, not going to do that. All right. What, you want the details? Yes, I did. Yes, I did save you from the golem. And I must have been mad. I stopped the golem from crushing your sorry head into a pulp. Then I ran away. That's all there is to it. Um, that wasn't exactly it so much. That is, okay, you know, thank you. But why? Why? See, he can't wrap his mind around it. What has been nearly <clears throat> destroyed in him by this point in the book? That he showed a lot of, especially in book one. Why did he go after Lovelace? I don't mean the amulet of Samarkand. I mean after, you know, 
that? Was it merely for personal revenge? Who was he thinking about when he was getting ready to go to, you know, Amanda Cathcart's party and all that kind of stuff? What did, how did Bartimaeus needle him? Who did he refer to multiple times? Martha and He kept appealing to John's Nathaniel's, Nathaniel's what? Sense of honor. Loyalty. Those virtues that Mr. Purcell, the history teacher, said, you know, all magicians have, but that Loveless said was what? This bunch of nonsense. Purcell bought and taught the propaganda. Loveless showed him the truth. Okay. He had a lot of those qualities in the first book. We start to see those subside a bit in the second book, and they're still kind of, they're there, but they've been buried. Right? I don't know. I really don't know. He tells her, put your coat on. You're getting soaked. It's raining like you care. What does his you're getting soaked tell us? He does care. Well, whatever reasons might have been, might have been, I suppose I need to, and she doesn't let him say it. No, I don't want to hear it. Not from you. Why not? It's almost the same kind of reason Frodo says in The Lord of the Rings at the beginning of the novel, I don't want to see Gollum. Right? He's just an enemy. He deserves death kind of a thing. Gandalf says, you know, once you see him, or implies, once you see him, you will feel pity for him. She can't accept for John to say what two words? Thank you. Why? Because then she kind of gets indebted to that. All right? He frowned. But you he, trying to get the words out. I did it without thinking. And if you want to know the truth, I've regretted it ever since. Whenever I've seen your hideous lying leaflets on the streets or past those stages where your actors do your lying for you. Notice, by the way, what she's saying about those stages and those actors, they're all what? They're in the work of the government. It's all, the propaganda isn't only from the government. It's from the government to those quarters of power that determine kind of the national consciousness. Well, what does that include? Obviously it includes schools, because that's where the propaganda is spread. It includes culture, it includes the stages and such. In our world, stages, theaters, movies, TV, internet, you know, that at least that's, you know, mainstream, so to speak. So don't thank me, Mr. Mandrake. <clears throat> if you must thank someone, and then she kind of <clears throat> puts down her ace of spades, make it Bartimaeus. He's the one who prompted me to save your life. And even in the dark, she could see it startle her. He prompted me? I find that hard to credit. Why? Because he's a demon? See? She cuts him to the core right there. You find it hard to believe because he's a demon. Yeah, I know. Doesn't make much sense. But he told me how to stop the golem. He called me back when I would have run. Without him, you'd be dead. Don't let that bother you. He's just a slave. So what does she just put into his mind? What has she just created for him? About? Keep going. Yeah, and about the nature, doubt about the nature of the human-demon relationship, right? As to what it could only be. From the magician's perspective, it's only, I command, 
you do what I command. Okay. What did his, what did his master Underwood teach him was the mark of a bad magician? What one word? Incompetence. Incompetence. Trusting a trusting a demon would be the highest mark of incompetence, according to Underwood. Right? I've been meaning to ask you about Bartimaeus. He regards you with affection. Why? What does Nathaniel seem to be blind to at that point when he asks that question? How does he respond to Jane Farrar when she says, torture the information out of him? So, no, he's a valuable demon. I mean, he's done a lot of good for me. I, I've got to send him out to recharge his batteries. In other words, he gives the kind of pro forma expected response. What doesn't he really say? He kind of likes Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus kind of, you know, think of Fluter. Bartimaeus is what to Nathaniel? As what is to Fluter? What keeps Fluter, what keeps Fluter plan more or less honest? Bing. Bartimaeus is like the string in the heart that you know breaks and makes the go, okay, okay, okay. So I embellish that a little bit. Okay? He keeps John somewhat honest. He serves in a sense as his alter ego or as his conscience. Or another way of putting it, think of those old Warner Brothers cartoons. You know, like Bugs Bunny and stuff. And you have one where you have a good demon, right? you have a good angel and a bad demon. And one sits on the right shoulder and one sits on the left shoulder. Bartimaeus is actually kind of acting like what? Both. I mean, yeah, he likes to get his goat a lot. He likes to, you know, really rile him up. But other times, he's like, John, come on, come on. This is not you. There is no affection between us. Kitty says, no? Then why did he tell me he was dead? He said the golem killed him. That is why I have not searched him. He said that. Notice, surprise, she hit him with a zinger. He hits her back with a zinger. She's not aware of this connection. Right? So now what are, what are these two magicians one of whom is also a commoner, revealed to us. We have, you know, a menage a trois of sorts. Who's at the center? Bartimaeus, Kitty, Nathaniel. But he's the one that links the two of them. Because he's shown concern for both of them. He tells Kitty how to save Nathaniel. He tells Nathaniel Kitty's dead, which is his way of how to save Kitty. I, I don't know. Perhaps it was because I treated him with some respect. Perhaps because I didn't enslave him. Perhaps because I didn't seek to keep him in service for year after year without a break till his essence wore away. And he's like, well, how do you know about that? You haven't seen Bartimaeus for years. Have you? Why does he ask that question? Because he has Bartimaeus. Have you seen Kitty? I, I, no. Okay. So, Orb shows up, announces to John that Quit and make peace once I'm there for the theater, and he says, you know, take your friend too. And she's like, John's like, we'll have to suffer together. Okay. Um, let's see. Skipping a lot. 
Finish this on Tuesday. Um, Bartimaeus gets captured by Hopkins and the quarrel. He escapes. I think I need to discuss any of that. Got it all marked up, but okay, uh, chapter twenty-one. <clears throat> and we'll probably finish around. I don't know. 915, 928. <clears throat> Chapter 21. Um, he looks out the window of the limo and he's thinking about what happened earlier that day. Successive crises, his humiliation at Richmond, the threats to his career, the discovery of his earlier betrayal by Bartimaeus had hit him hard. So he's sitting there thinking this while Kitty's sitting next to him. Right? His carefully constructed persona of John Mandrake, information minister and blithely assured member of the council, had begun to crack around him. But it had been his rejection by Mrs. Lutchins that morning that had dealt the decisive blow. In a few moments of sustained contempt, she had shattered the armor of his status and laid bare the boy beneath. The shock had been almost too much for him. With the loss of self-esteem came chaos. He had spent the rest of the day locked in his rooms, alternately raging and subsiding into silence. Okay? What was the rejection by Mrs. or Ms. Lutchens? Do you remember? He's in his car and he sees this woman on the road and he recognizes her. He has the car stop. He gets out, you know, mentions who he is. She's like, I don't know who that kid is. He asks how she's doing. She kind of says, like all the other commoners, life sucks. And he offers to help her. What does she say? I don't need anybody. And she says, the boy that I taught, what? Doesn't exist anymore. That boy is in danger. This boy is John Mandrake. And he kind of says, you know, yeah, well, you don't need to have anything. He goes, don't worry about it. I haven't thought about you. Okay. It's that rejection. Okay. What does that seem, what purpose does that seem serve? Notice we're going to start being told next couple of paragraphs. That happens the night he meets Kitty. That happens the morning of the night that he meets Kitty. He finds out, you know, it's true, Kitty did save his life, and that Bartimaeus put her up to it. We, we get the description of, you know, the facade that he created about John Mandrake starts to crumble. Well, what's a facade? It's a false covering. It's like the outside of this building. Okay? Or, or, or think of, you know, pictures of castles in movies where the castle has a nice shiny white wall and everything. That's the covering. If you go to an ancient castle in England today, you'll see the big blocks. Well, you didn't see those blocks when those castles were finished construction because they had mortar entirely covering them. All right? That's the facade. It gets pulled off. You know, uh, brick siding on a house or vinyl siding. That's the facade. The wall is what's behind that. Okay? So he's created this facade of John Mandrake, young man about town, you know, member of the council, 17 years old, ultra powerful, blah, blah, blah. And we're told it's all cracked now. The only reason facades crack is because they're false, poorly made, poorly constructed. So when she 
you know, cuts him to the quick with her comments. It's almost like she's hit the pilot light inside him. And the pilot light lights up the real person. You see? It causes that identity to kind of rebloom, reblossom. And he no longer wished to play that part. Let's go back for a second. Page 282. Um, he's thinking about the trial that's coming up. He's drowning in self pity. Bartimaeus is, uh, bottom of 281, delayed report, had given him a lifeline. News of Hopkins' whereabouts offered Nathaniel a final chance, to, you know, before the next day's trial. Such success was not guaranteed, but he was confident in the power of the gen he had sent to the hotel. He'd already felt revived by the mere act of sending him. Right? That was how it often had been, before politics and the stultifying role of John Mandrake had closed in on him. He no longer wished to play that part. Notice the language that's being used. Light as what? The stage. Shakespeare talks about this in the play, As You Like It, with the character, you know, either Jaquees or Amiens, it talks about, you know, life's a stage, and everyone has their part to play, and there are seven ages, seven, you know, stages in the life of man, etc. So John's telling us, or Nathaniel's telling us, thinking, he doesn't want to play this part anymore. He's done with it. True, if fate were kind, he would first ensure his political survival. But he had long been tired of the other ministers and sickened by their moral corruption, by their self-preserving greed. Now, you could say, okay, this is a little bit of self-righteousness, a little bit of high-mindedness about himself. It had taken until today with the disdain in the eyes of Miss Lucian and of Kitty Jones to recognize the sickness in himself. In other words, Miss Lucian's and Kitty served as what? To John. Notice to John. Mirrors. Their disdain for him was like him looking in a mirror. And what did he see? Kind of like an interchange. John Mandrake. John Mandrake. Which is real. Nathaniel's the real one. John Mandrake's the false identity. And the sickness? It's the moral corruption. The self-preserving greed. The greed there isn't for wealth. It's for self-preservation at all costs. That is, everybody else be damned. Well, he would not sink back into the routines of the council. He would not be like all those others. Unbeknownst to him, what is about to happen? The climate. I mean, all, everything, the whole thing is about to go kablooey, right? which is good that he's making this decision at this point. Decisive action was needed to save the country from their mismanagement. He peered through the window at the smudged outlines. What's meant by decisive action? What's John been wanting to do since the second book? Get his hands on the right hand staff. He tried it at the end of the previous book, right? He's got the staff. He's trying to work out the spells. And it knocks him out. Okay. Golden nearly kills him. Kitty rescues him. Oh, my goodness. He peered through the window at the smudged outlines of people on the street. The commoners needed to be led. They needed a new leader. He's 17. Someone who could impose a little peace and security. He thought of the staff of Gladstone line redundant in the vaults of Whitehall. What does redundant mean there? Redundant is like when you do something over and over again. You say something over and over again. How is it, how is it being redundant? Well, 
We don't use this terminology in the United States, but they do in Britain. If you're made redundant in your job, anybody know what that means? You're downsized, to use the American term. You're fired. You're redundant means you're not needed. The staff of Gladstone is lying, not needed, supposedly. Right? Why doesn't England use it? Why doesn't Devereux use it? I mean, it's the ultimate power. Because they think no one is strong enough to use it. Not that he should use force, of course. No, no, I'm not going to go there. At least not on the commoners. He's not going to use the staff of Gladstone to you know, kill all the commoners. Kitty Jones had been right about that. He glanced across to where a great, a great everybody close to him. He likes that idea of him. John kind of likes having Kitty nearby. The girl sat, gazing with remarkable serenity out into the night. Okay? She'd been the second reason his energy had revived, his spark for Kenneth. And he was very glad that he had found her. Her hair was shorter than he remembered. Her tongue was sharp as ever. In their argument outside the end, she'd cut through his pretensions like a knife. In other words, she does what to him? I mean, you could say, okay, yeah, romantically, erotically, whatever, she arouses him. But what else? She's an equal. She's a commoner. She's an equal. She's someone he can engage in mental combat or play with. Who else is his equal? Bartimaeus. Okay. So, they go to the theater, uh, 285. He addresses make peace, you know, and says there's problems in the streets, and make peace says, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then he tells 285, make peace does. Three minutes, I must be on stage. Hall doors are shut, but I have space for you in my personal box. Yes, yes, your girlfriend too. Notice it's girlfriend combined as a single word. It's not girlfriend. She is far prettier than you or I. We can bask in her radius. Come on, chop, chop, two minutes counting. All right? John, page 286, exact middle of the page, leans over to Kitty as the play is about to begin. Yeah. And he says to her, What? What a pity your resistance is no longer active. A well directed bomb here would decapitate. Now, does he mean, oh, this is going to cost me so much. Let's do it right now. That's the one we read that. Or is he kind of suggesting, or kind of just saying something more like, you know, if you guys were organized, this would be your opportunity right now. Whereas one is more objective, and one is more, Not pensive, it's the phrase I want. One is more said longingly. Well, what literally in the next few minutes is about to happen, unbeknownst to John at this point? That. But it's not going to be the resistance, right? So, uh, Takes his lenses out like he's told to, 289, he puts them back in. And what does he see? The man was a capricious fool with a mixture of annoyment and bemusement. Nathaniel returned his lenses to his eyes, 289. By viewing the second and third planes, he was instantly able to reduce the darkness in the auditorium and make out the magicians on the far side. Okay? And he also sees, you know, demons and such. 
Make peace asks two ninety. Does Miss Jones enjoy the show? Nathaniel's grin freezes. How did you know this is Miss Jones? Oh, I probably knew this was not Miss Jones. Hush, hush. Here we come. Climax of a performance. Okay. Two ninety, two ninety one. Um, what did make peace mean at the very bottom of two ninety? That is, what did he mean by what? I think it's, I know many things. Okay? Nathaniel looks and sees again, got his lenses on. In the darkest shadows, he could just make out three exit doors leading to the lobby, and through these doors came creeping a multitude of tiny demons. They held loops of rope and cloth, their owners hopped and sprang, skittered and dodged. The leaders leaped into the seats without delay, fell upon the person sitting there. Two or three imps to each. Okay? Rag stuffed in mouths, hands bound. So sudden was the onslaught, skipping down about three quarters of the way down. Most of the audience was secured without a noise. Nathaniel Wars, he sees it all. Okay. Who else can see this without lenses? He can, right? She saw the mowler when John tried to attack her with it back in her parents' apartment. He made to spring to his feet, cold steel pressed against his neck. Make peace. Do nothing foolish, my boy. You observe my finest hour. Is this not art of the highest order? Art. Artifice. What does artifice mean? What does artificial mean? Constructed by us. What is he constructing? What is he designing and making? His own real play. And I mean real. He's directing the actor's in his own drama. Okay. Well, what are we going to find out very shortly? How does Quentin Makepeace come off in the first two books? What kind of person, what kind of character, what kind of personality? If you were to read about him in the newspaper, what would you think about him? A narcissist, first of all, right? Everything's about him. What else? What are most narcissists? That's all they're concerned about. And so they come across as kind of like bumbling fools. Because they don't see the bigger picture of anything. What has he done? John used the language earlier, excuse me, Nathaniel used the language earlier about John Mandrake. He's created the facade. It's a character that he's made of the narcissistic playwright who has to have people praise his plays to stroke his ego. Okay? <clears throat> it's not who he really is. Um, Two ninety four. Got the knife still pressed against his throat. And make peace gets up with agonizing caution right in the middle. Nathaniel turned his head a fraction. His eyes met Kitty's lacking lenses. The girl had only become aware of the activity at the very end. She doesn't see it all. Eyes wide, she glanced at Nathaniel and at last saw, at last saw make peace and the knife. Her face showed confusion, doubt, and disbelief. Confusion? What the hell's going on? Doubt? Are we going to make it out of here? Disbelief. He and I are in the same boat. That is, John is now pretty much just like all the comics. Nathaniel held her gaze. His mouth worked frantically, uttering silent pleas. His eyebrows attempted complicated supplication. It's like he's trying to mouth words and indicate meaning with moving his eyebrows. If the knife could just be knocked away just for an instant, he might leap on make peace, tear it from his grip. Quick, if she could only act now while the madman was distracted. What's being suggested there? He could do what? See her. If he could only distract make peace long enough, Kitty looked across at make peace, then at Nathaniel, her brow furrowed, swept round. Ran down the side of her face. We're going to finish with this. 
It was no good. She wasn't going to help them. This is Nathaniel's chapter, so this is him thinking. Why should she? She held him in contempt. Then Nathaniel saw Kitty give the slightest of nods. In other words, everything he had just thought was totally wrong. He saw her tent prepared to spring. He licked his lips, readying himself. She leaped forward, a bolt of green energy smashed into her, knocking her back. And because of her resilience, it doesn't totally immobilize her, etc., etc. Green flames rise smoking. The dumbling Nathaniel stood around the hall. The command had been repeated a hundred times. Nathaniel says, you brought ruin upon us all. Hardly, John. We stand at the dawn of a new age. Ow. Curtain has come down and I must attend to the logistics. And a tall figure in a black coat shows up. The mercenary. The guy who shows up from the first book who has the seven league, seven league boots, not something he's created, by the way, Stroud, that's a uh, folktale motif, boots that you put on, they enable you to cover great distances in a short amount of time. No doubt you will have much to discuss. They will not demean you, John, by uttering petty threats, but I do have one word of advice. Do not choose to die like poor young Kitty Bear. In other words, she's dead. She just doesn't know it. I still have much to show you. And he disappears. Okay, we will do as much of part four as we can on Tuesday. Um, I haven't done it yet. I'll put up a quiz. I'll put up a quiz for everything to this point. Later on today, that will be due to Sunday. And again, I apologize for all the confusion and waste of time at the beginning of class. This is not my semester.